so this is what I'll be talking about um, today. Um, and um, so we all know that um, personal networks uh, are dynamic, uh, that uh, they change over time in response, as Claire really nicely showed us, uh, in response to shifts in the social environment, to individuals' development over the life course, and the experience of uh, various life events. Uh, but we also know that personal networks show a notable constancy in their aggregate attributes um, over time, and this has been uh, one of the discussed uh, paradoxes uh, in the literature on um, longitudinal research on personal networks. So, um, is it the case that uh, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose? Okay, that's uh, sort of the big question, and what is going on here? We're trying to um, address this uh, complex uh, question. A few words about, um, okay, how, a few words about the sources of change in personal networks. Um, so there's uh, one source of change related to which outers are included in the network. Um, as we know, some outers are lost and others are gained. This is really a question about composition, which relates to network turnover or churn. Uh, and our presentation today is about this source of change, uh, but uh, it's important to mention another source of change, which is related to the nature of the relationship with ego for those elders who remain in the network. So, for, for example, if you know a coworker becomes a friend or, or a neighbor becomes a friend, so their role in the network changes. Uh, uh, this is uh, referred to in the literature as a change in function, and um, we're not going to talk. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, about that in this presentation, but it's important to remember that this is also a source of change in personal networks. Um, so, after saying a few words about sources of change, let's say a few words about sources of stability in personal networks. Um, networks may appear stable because individuals have fixed preferences uh, related, for example, to their personal inclinations and related to personality um, trends, um, and also because they often face opportunity constraints that make them connect to the same kinds of people. And uh, this resonates with the homeostasis hypothesis um, that also contends that you know, people form new ties to replace lost ones, but in a way that maintains the general character of their personal networks. Um, so, there are several implications to this idea. One is that losses and additions will offset each other, uh, and what we'll see is that network size remains constant or stable over time, more or less. Uh, it also, uh, another implication is that added ties will resemble lost ties because of these structural constraints or uh, personality, preferen personal preferences, so um, if the lost ties and the added ties uh, resemble each other, uh, this means that network composition and structural features of the network will show constancy um, over time. Um, it's important when we talk about sources of uh, change and stability, it's uh, important to say a few words about some measurement issues, which are related to the um, name eliciting method or egocentric uh, method of collecting network data um, because, because the big question is when we observe uh, some kind of change or, the, or di uh, dynamics in networks, um, is it related to uh, measurement? Does it reflect measurement issues or does it reflect something true, quote unquote, that happens in ego's life? So um, let me say a few words about these measurement issues uh, because they are so critical to uh, what we can say about what we see when we measure uh, network dynamics. Um, so one issue is related to this idea that when we use name generators, uh, we're really tapping with a, a kind of a process of mental sampling. Um, Observed differences in network composition and structure may in fact reflect 
the different samples that respondents draw at different times from their network population. So as I said before, to what extent do changes in networks uh, reflect substantive changes in respondents' lives, or is it just you know, a, a different picture that is taken uh, at different uh, um, times of the survey? Um, another issue, which is uh, related to uh, those ties that are lost, uh, how can we distinguish between lost ties uh, versus forgotten or dormant ties? Uh, I won't get into that. Claude and I have a whole paper about that, uh, which was recently published in um, Social Networks. So uh, if you're interested, you can have a look at that paper. Um, we also have a new study about uh, the additions, uh, about those ties that are that show up later in, in, the, in the survey. Um, we had a whole uh, presentation about that in a few uh, weeks ago in, uh, during Sunbelt. Um, so I won't say too much about that. Uh, I will just mention that the big issue here is um, how can we distinguish between truly new ties and dormant or forgotten ties. Um, when we see new ties uh, in a survey, in a longitudinal survey of egocentric networks, these newly listed ties are not necessarily truly new ties or new associate, meaning, meaning alters who were uh, previously, who were not known previously to the um, respondent, to ego, or were not um, known well to ego. Um, and um, just a few, um, an important uh, information about this is uh, in that new study, uh, Claude and I found that uh, about 40% of these newly listed ties um, are what we call uh, truly new. So people or alters not previously known or not well known to ego. Uh, whereas about 60%, which is a lot, uh, um, are actually dormant ties that were awakened. Um, so this is another important distinction that we uh, have to make. And uh, another measurement issue, uh, which is the, relates to the usual noise of name eliciting methods, um, distraction, fatigue, satisfying, recency, interview effects. A lot has been written about that. I won't get into that. But altogether, um, these issues, these measurement and methodological issues um, suggest that uh, much of the observed uh, turnover or churn uh, that we observe in many studies and that were reported in many studies um, reflect measurement errors, uh, not true change, um, which, uh, as we suggested earlier, may be uh, the true change may be uh, substantially lower. Um, okay, so keeping this in mind, um, what do we uh, uh, what do we examine in this specific study? Our research questions are first at the alter or tie level. Uh, we want to see examine how many ties are lost and how many are added in the course of uh, a four year period. Um, which alters are dropped? Which are added? This will help us identify different alter trajectories. I'll present them um, in a moment. Um, and then we ask which alter characteristics are associated with each type of trajectory. Um, and do added alters represent a substantive change in terms of their characteristics from dropped ones, from dropped alters, or to what degree do added alters resemble lost ones? So all these questions are at the outer or tie level, and uh, then we move to the network or respondent level, and we ask how much churn occurs in personal networks uh, with respect to changes also in size and composition, and then uh, which egos are likely to experience network shrinking, network expansion, or stability, and why. And I will say that we're not going to get to question five here. This will be uh, uh, in future research, uh, but this is where we're heading. Um, okay, 
a few words about um, uh, the implications of uh, the theoretical implications of these questions. Uh, why are they important? So distinguishing between different types of ties and tracking their destinies across um, a four-year period help us better understand the ways by which people build and rebuild their networks. Uh, and these have implications for Eagle's life. Um, Claire talked a lot about that. We only have three waves, so we're, we're much more restricted. But um, that's eventually where we want to go. Um, new ties, so for example, new ties might link people to new resources and information, which can be crucial, we know, uh, can be crucial for social and economic mobility. Uh, by contrast, awakening dormant ties or replacing drop ties with new but similar ones uh, may provide a deep well of potential support. Uh, so uh, after we take into account and do our best to address those measurement issues, we really want to say something about, uh, about the true change in networks uh, and what that mean, what does that mean for uh, Eagle's life. So to address these questions, we use uh, data from the UCNET's uh, uh, panel. Uh, I won't say too much about the technicalities of the, of the study and uh, its characteristics. There going, there's going to be uh, um, a whole session about, a workshop about um, the UCNET's data. I would just like to emphasize that uh, UCNET has uh, three waves, uh, and in this study we use respondents who, who uh, participated in all three waves. Uh, and uh, UCNET focuses, as Claude mentioned before, uh, two age groups. Uh, so I refer to them for, uh, to be brief, to the young and the old cohort, although the old is not that old. Okay. Um, anyway, let me turn now to some of the results. And um, I would like to say that um, all the results I'm going to present here today are uh, descriptives. This is, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time constructing the data, cleaning the data. Uh, so this is um, where we are right now uh, at the descriptive level. But um, we're very curious to hear um, more and get your suggestions about you know, more complex modeling, what can we do uh, at the analytic level. Um, okay, oh, before turning to the results, sorry, I will uh, just to say a few words um, about the, one of the major advantages of the uh, UCNET's data, and uh, that's the extended egocentric survey um, that uh, collects data about using seven name generating questions. You can see them on this slide here. Um, so this is really a, a very uh, big advantage because uh, UCNET does not rely on, on a restricted number of name generators or just one, but it has seven, so it gives a much richer um, understanding of a potential for understanding of what's going on in personal networks. These are the seven name generators. Uh, and then there are follow-up questions, the famous name descriptors uh, for each of the names that were, uh, that was mentioned in uh, one of the, at least one of the seven name generators. So you can see here the type of uh, information that was gathered in UCNET about each of the authors mentioned. Um, uh, about their role relationship, you know, the role in the network, um, their uh, descriptors, their characteristics, and also characteristics of their relationship with ego. Okay, so now I will turn to some um, descriptive results. Um, let me start with those um, seven uh, outer trajectories. So if we have three waves, uh, there are different, there are seven different altered trajectories. So what happens to uh, the alters um, over the course of those three waves? 
So um, we can see here, for example, so here are the three waves. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the pointer. Okay. So here we have the three waves. Um, and here are the seven different trajectories. So the first one is uh, what we call the retained alters. They show up in all three waves. We can see it's about 20% in the young cohort, slightly uh, higher in the older cohort. But there are different possibilities, different trajectories. We have here the drop rate. They show up in the first two waves, but eventually they're dropped. Um, they're the dropped early. They were mentioned only in the first wave, but not in the two uh, consecutive waves. This is also turned out to be um, a relatively common trajectory in both age groups, a little more so in the younger, in the younger one. We have the, uh, the added ties, so added early, added late. Okay, we can see about the same uh, frequency in the two age groups. And we have some transitory um, alters. Um, you know, they showed up here in the first wave, disappeared, re-emerged. Uh, and those who uh, were not mentioned at wave one, but at wave two were then not mentioned at wave two. There, there are quite a few of these, actually. Um, and um, so, you know, what, what, what's, what's going on here? Unfortunately, we have only three waves. We don't have, uh, as Claire has in her study, more waves, so we can see, you know, what will happen later. Maybe these people here, these alters will show up later uh, because of some life event or simply because uh, they reappeared for some reason in their respondent's mind at the time of the survey. Um, so in a way, we have to remember that these three waves provide some Uh, you know, maybe they were consistently there and for some reason they disappeared uh, in the first wave. That would be a very different scenario from, you know, someone who uh, wasn't there for uh, a long time or at all and then appeared for one wave and then disappeared. And we also, we don't know what will happen or what happened after wave three. Um, you know, maybe these people, uh, alters here in this group, eventually disappeared because of something happened. Okay, so we don't know that. We have to remember that we have some you know, limited data. I mean, three waves, it's good, but it's still, um, it has some limitations. Um, okay, so let's see, um, uh, now that I presented here these trajectories and we have some idea of the frequencies of uh, the different trajectories. Uh, let's see who is dropped and who is added. That's um, this slide here. Okay, I have to move the audience up and down the screen. Okay, so let's see what uh, the intersection between uh, the different trajectories, and I uh, collapsed them here uh, to four trajectories for ease of presentation, but we can talk about that later on. Uh, how to treat those seven trajectories. Um, so here it's the, we can see the intersection between four trajectories, retained, dropped, added, and those transitory, and the role of the alter in the network, um, the initial role. So when they were, what was their role when they were first named in the network? Um, the categories are spouse, partner, immediate kin, extended kin, and non-kin. So we can see here some interesting patterns. Um, and overall, there are many similarities between the two age groups. So for example, we can see that closer ties, uh, more intimate ties, such as spouse, partners, and immediate kin are um, more likely to be, or there's a high percentage of, of them who, are, uh, who stay in the network in the course of the three waves. You can see the percentages here um, in the young cohort as well as in the older cohort. Um, drop ties, we can see, um, for example, that you know, partners in the younger cohort, much more than in the older cohort here, they're likely to be dropped at some point in the course of the three years, of the four years, or three waves. Okay, we can see here it's about 20%. 
um, in the younger cohort here, partners are, um, who are dropped, um, eventually dropped in the older cohorts, it's about half, okay? Uh, but we can see that uh, extended kin and non-kin in both the old, the young and the old cohort here, um, there's here some transition, okay? They're likely to be dropped, but also to be added, and we can see similar, relatively similar uh, percentages in the older cohort. Um, in a way, uh, what we did next to make it a little simpler um, is to look at, um, you know, alters who were present for two consecutive uh, waves, uh, uh, present in the network for two consecutive waves um, uh, by those uh, role relationship categories. So we can really see here uh, a clear uh, distinction between those the, 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 um, those alters who constitute the core of the network versus the more distant or peripheral areas, areas of the network. Um, it's really sort of a mirror. We can see here that um, spouses, partners, and immediate kin uh, are much more likely to be in the network for two consecutive, at least two consecutive waves, um, whereas extended kin and non-kin uh, are significantly less likely to be there for two or more consecutive waves. Um, okay, so turning next to the alter um, characteristics. Um, what we see here, and I would like to focus on those who are dropped and those who are added. Uh, it's, we're less interested in, in, here in, in those alters that are retained and those transitory alters. Uh, what we see here is, so the measures, uh, let me say a few words about the measures first. So here we have four measures, basically of measures of homophily. We have um, alters who are of the same gender as ego, alters of the same age, about the same age, same race, race and ethnicity, and same religion. So what we see here is the percentages. Okay, so for example, uh, among alters who were eventually dropped, so either at wave two or at wave three, <clears throat> um, alters who were dropped, about 61% in the young cohort are of the same gender. But what's interesting is that 60% of those alters that were added, either at wave two or wave three, are also of the same gender. Um, here are the percentages for the dropped and the added alters uh, of the same age. We can see the percentages are very close. Uh, here there's a larger difference, at least in the younger cohort, uh, not in the old one. Uh, here we do see a difference between those who are dropped and those who are added in terms of race and ethnicity. Uh, but uh, in terms of religion, again, very similar percentages. As, so it suggests that there is some kind of replacement, with the exception of uh, race and ethnicity in the young court. With respect to the other characteristics, there is really this image of, um, or this looks like there's a process of replacement here of the same kind of alters. Um, and we'll see in a minute how this. Um, what the implications are for at the aggregated level. Okay, so I will turn now to the uh, network level. Um, network characteristics across the three waves. What we see here is um, network size uh, for the young and the old cohort. Here we have the three waves. And it's very clear that at the network level, there is a lot of stability. Uh, the network size, based on the seven main generators, um, network size is around 10 uh, alters overall. Um, very, very small changes across waves. You know, sometimes it's a little below 10, sometimes a little above 10, but by and large, there is stability in network size. We see that uh, from a different angle here. Um, where we calculated the mean number of ties who are 
uh, again, what's interesting here is to look at the dropped and added, or dropped and dropped late, dropped and added, uh, added and added late. So um, the numbers of ties, and you can see that you know if if the mean number, uh, the mean size of the network is about ten, then uh, to uh, uh, to uh, lose about five and a half ties is a lot, okay? But at the same time, 5.3 uh, ties are also added eventually, okay? So again, we see this effect of replacement in terms of size. We see it um, in the young cohort, and the numbers here are slightly higher. We see it also in the old cohort, and the numbers are, are, are a little smaller here. Uh, but this, again, this uh, same replacement, this is just saying the same thing differently. Um, let's quickly turn to network characteristics across the three waves uh, in terms of composition. Um, so what we see in terms of same gender, um, again, uh, what we see is a lot of stability. You know, there's some very small changes here, but uh, overall, it's really uh, several percentages. It doesn't mean much. Okay, so stability in terms of the gender composition. Um, a little more fluctuation with respect to age, but again, this is not, these are not big changes, okay, for both cohorts. Um, same thing with race and ethnicity. A little more um, dynamism here in the younger cohort. Um, but older cohorts, practically no change. Um, and a lot of stability as well with respect to same uh, religion. So just a few words uh, to summarize this and some preliminary conclusions. Uh, so first we uh, see more stability at the individual or network level than at the Thai or alto level. In other words, most of the action is at the Thai. Um, level, and um, this is very consistent with other uh, studies. Um, going back to the altered trajectories, the most common trajectories are those who stay uh, uh, forever, perhaps, okay, those who disappear early, um, those who join late, and those who simply appear to be passing by, perhaps. Um, we want to have a closer look at what can explain that. Um, but what this suggests, at least uh, at this stage, preliminary stage of the analysis, is that there is a kind of a, some kind of stability at the core, which consists mainly of spouses and, to a lesser extent though, but also partners and immediate kin. Extended kin and non-kin are more dynamic um, in their trajectories, and but they also, and that's interesting, have a have relatively similar trajectories. Um, added ties appear to offset lost ties, both in terms of numbers, number, and characteristics. So this supports the homeostasis hypothesis. Um, and for future analysis, uh, we want to examine, among other things, variation in network dynamics by individual characteristics and life events. So what can explain those different um, trajectories and what are their implications for ego's life uh, above and beyond those measurement issues that uh, I mentioned uh, before. Uh, so thank you and we look forward to um, uh, hear more about your thoughts on all of that, all of that and where to go from here.